All right. I forgot what to pray for. Okay. Um, Gene Brown, I, you know, last week I told you mm -hmm. he home. Well, this week he led charity outside and up and going. Going on by his business. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. That's been a long time, hasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. We, another lady and I were talking. It's been like over a year. Wow. He's been giving. Yeah. He had surgery on the knee and then they had to go back and read. Yeah. I think it's about the third time they did it one knee. So they go back in and redo the whole entire thing. But he's doing seem doing real well. Oh, praise God for that. Yeah. Praise I know that had to be tough on him. He's he's usually a very busy man and up and into everything and so all right. So um before we actually get into the lesson, if you turn it to the back page, this two paragraphs. This has nothing to do with the lesson. It has to do with our calendar for this summer. <laughs> so kind of like mark that off because we're going to quit before that. We're going to talk about that later. But um, we've been hung up for a while studying on faith. And faith is the second thing in our seven most important things on prayer. Today we're going to study forgive as you have been forgiven again. And that's what the main part of our lesson is about. And um, I'm, I'm going in a little deeper than what the book went into because I feel like there's a lot of things that we can tie together from everything that we've been studying that, um, that we need to actually solidify and get, get down into us. But we are going to finish out the seven most important things in prayer today. The reason that we're going to kind of go quickly through the rest of them is because Probably we're going to dive in deep on the Holy Spirit when we come back in the fall. And we have, you know, um, had lessons on him a little bit here and there in the last six months. But, but I feel like we really need to go in deep as to what he's, you know, he was sent to comfort us. He was sent to empower us. He was sent to really help us in our daily walk. And so we will be headed there. We are going to finish this out, um, and then in the next, I think we have three more weeks after we come back from Memorial Day, we will finish out this book. And so there will be a lot of, um, because what's left in there, a lot of it is kind of review. We, it's good review. We need to, you know, hit on it again because um, some of the stuff we need to hear over and over, but... Um, we're going to finish it out so that in the fall we can come back and go on with some stuff that we want to go on with. So the um, second most important thing in prayer is faith. The first is that we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. In Mark 11, 23 and 24, we've been going over those verses a lot. We are told that when we pray, we must believe that we receive. And we shall have what we pray for. The first verse, 23, is the one where if you say to this mountain, be thou removed and have faith, it will, it will be removed. In faith, we can have what we say rather than saying what we have. Every word, every word we speak is either a word of faith or a word of doubt. It is a blessing or a curse. And, you know, I used to read those verses that say that, and I used to think, well, curse words, you know, four-letter words. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's either positive words that are going to come to pass, or it's negative words that are going to come to pass. We find these truths all throughout Scripture, but there's a lot of, especially those verses in Proverbs and Psalms, we read over and over about the tongue and speaking and thinking. I challenge you to stop, pay attention, and behold to when the scriptures say someone said, and then that it says what they said comes to pass. You know, we've been reading that stuff, and it's, it's jumping out at us now, right? Our faith, our belief is tied up in our words. Our words are founded in our thoughts, and our thoughts are founded in our hearts. Renewing our minds in the scriptures will fix the root 
the heart, the soil, so that the seed, the words, the harvest will come. So the third thing is to forgive if you have ought against any. So Mark 11, 25 through 26, which is just going on with that scripture that we've been on, Jesus says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Leave it, let it go, in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your failings and shortcomings. So prayer won't work unless we have a forgiving heart. Last week we talked a lot about the parables that Jesus taught and we mentioned this one about the talent or the money, but didn't dive into it. As we do, remember that Jesus said the parable of the sower is the key to all the other parables. The seed is the word of God and the soil is our heart. In Matthew 18, 23 through 35, we find this parable. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a human king who wished to settle accounts with his attendants. When he began the accounting, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, which at the time of the translation of the Amplified Bible was probably about $10 million. It's probably more than that now. And because he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything that he possessed and payment to be made. So the attendant fell on his knees begging him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And his master's heart was moved with compassion. And he released him and forgave him, canceling the debt. But that same attendant, as he went out, found one of his fellow attendants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is about twenty dollars. And he caught him up by the throat and said, pay what you owe. So his fellow attendant fell down and begged him earnestly, give me time and I will pay you all. But he was unwilling and he went out and had him put in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow attendants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and told everything that had taken place to their master. Then his master called him and said to him, You contemptible and wicked attendant, I forgave and canceled all that great debt of yours because you begged me to. And should you not have had pity and mercy on your fellow attendant as I had pity and mercy on you? And in wrath his master turned him over to the torturers, the jailers, till he should pay all that he owed. So also my heavenly Father will deal with every one of you if you do not freely forgive your brother from your heart his offenses. So Jesus paid all of our debts on Calvary. All of our debts. And we owed lots and lots, you know, billions of dollars in the equivalent, you know, of, of everything that we've done wrong. The debt that we that we should have our arms outstretched on the cross for, for what we did. And Jesus paid it all. And, and he tells us to forgive others just as we've been forgiven. I was going to say, that's the scary part is, is really, you know, we really are forgiving people the way we really should be doing it. Yes. You know, we, sometimes we say, oh, yeah, well, I forgive them. And, and yet still really deep down inside, you might be still holding back a little bit or something. Yeah. So that's, to me, is a scary part. Yeah. And then we turn around and, and, and use what we're doing to somebody else on us, we really get scary. You know, the, the greatest commandment which Jesus gave us was that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, you know... There's all kinds of different ways that people leave out pieces and parts of that in their lives because some people hate themselves. You know, they love everybody else, but they hate themselves. Some people, you know, are bitter at everyone else and, and I don't know, you know. But, yeah, and, and some people hold things against God, you know. And, and so, but that, those two verses, that commandment that Jesus gave us, that greatest commandment summed up the Ten Commandments. You don't have to. It covered it all. 
covered every one of them. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to take us back to Genesis 12 too, when the Lord blessed Abraham. And he said in Genesis 12 too, he said, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you with abundant increase of favors and make your name famous and distinguished, and you will be a blessing dispensing good to others. When you take that in the context of forgive as we have been forgiven, you know, when God starts blessing us, we're to bless others because God gives us what we need plus. He's a God of abundance, right? He's El Shaddai. He likes to, he likes to go overboard and just, you know, bless us beyond belief. But he does that so that we can be a blessing to others. So whether we're talking about the blessing of money or the blessing of the fruits of the Spirit, when we go back to the beginning of our familiar blessing, which was with Father Abraham, God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. By being a blessing to others, we are blessing God. By being a blessing to others, we are magnifying God. By being a blessing to others, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit will be visible in our lives. In Proverbs 29, 22 through 27, we read, A man of wrath stirs up strife, and a man given to anger commits and causes much transgression. A man's pride will bring him low, but he who is of a humble spirit will obtain honor. Whoever is partner with a thief hates his own life. He falls under the curse pronounced upon him who knows who the thief is, but discloses nothing. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever leans on, trusts in, and puts his confidence in the Lord is safe and set on high. Many crave and seek the ruler's favor, but the wise man waits for justice from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way of the Lord is an abomination to the wicked. So in order to walk continually with the Lord, we have to learn to walk not by our natural emotions, but by our spiritual emotions. Walk by the fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians 5, 22 through 25, which again is the definition of love that we find in 1 Corinthians 13. We have to walk out our lives in love, first love for the Father, and then in love for the neighbor as we also love ourselves. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, Paul tells us, So this I say and solemnly testify in the name of the Lord as in his presence, that you must no longer live as the heathen, the Gentiles do, in their perverseness, in the folly, vanity, and emptiness of their souls and the futility of their minds. Their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is beclouded. They are alienated, estranged, self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the ignorance, the one of knowledge and perception, the willful blindness that is deep-seated in them due to their hardness of heart, to the insensitiveness of their moral nature. In their spiritual apathy, they have become callous and past feeling and reckless and have abandoned themselves a prey to unbridled sensuality, eager and greedy to indulge in every form of impurity that their depraved desires may suggest and demand. You know, a lot of the times when we um, get our feelings hurt or hurt someone else's feelings because we also are the guilty ones, um, it's to those closest to us, right? We know exactly and they know exactly how to push our buttons and we know how to push their buttons. We know exactly the most, um, the thing to say that is going to, to make the most impact at the time. And um, I've, I've been guilty of this, you know. Um, we've, we've had our arguments. I've had my arguments with my brothers. I've had my arguments with my husband. I've had arguments with my children, even. They know, they know and I know, and we all know exactly what to say that's going to push their buttons. Who you be trying to 
really push their buttons or just trying to get ahead. And you know what it takes to get ahead. Does it matter? <laughs> to win. Yeah. Yeah, you want to win. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, win, so I It's all the win. same. Yeah. It's all the same. But, <clears throat> you know, when, when we step back and we can say, you know, um, when we always have at the forefront of our mind, because we're renewing our mind, that Jesus, you know, has forgiven us for so much, and we start living that lifestyle, it's, it does make it easier when somebody, when you're like, oh, that kind of hurt, you know, to, to let it drop. Let it go. Now, and I, I don't know where that's at in the lesson. I'm fixing to go into this anyway. There have been times recently, because, you know, we've been in this for like a year and a half now. We've been studying pretty heavily the Word. And, and I do feel like there have been times recently when I was like, okay, God, you've got this, you know, and, and, and I just have to like shut up because I haven't, you know, it's, it's like um, Janine was saying a couple of weeks ago. She's like, I'm afraid to speak now. So, you know, we're all learning to shut up first, and then we'll learn to speak, you know. And um, so, you know, but we'll, I'll find myself in a position where, like, yesterday, um, we started out the morning in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I've talked about Tilly time a lot, which I need to stop. Um, I need to find a way to put that in a positive aspect. And, um, you know, we got up, we finished the convention that we were at, that we were supposed to be doing, and we were in the airplane, had the pilot down there with us. We got up down there, and it was storming. And, um, but it is the professional pilot. We weren't, you know, VFR. We were IFR, and, and all was good, and I text adjacent, well, Jimmy decides his new best friends need a ride home to New Braunfels because they had arrived in a rental car that they could turn back in. And here I was like, we have Bible study at 6 o'clock at night at my house, you know, and so I had to like, all right, God, you've got this, and there's probably a purpose for this, and, you know, um, and we had, I was home by 4 after all of that, but, you know, it's, it, that's what I'm talking about when I say it's like he knows. He didn't do that intentionally. He makes new best friends everywhere he goes. Mm -hmm. That's the man that he is. Mm -hmm. It's the man that we all love about him. And, and he didn't say, oh, well, I'm going to make her nervous. And, and, and he wasn't intentionally doing that. But he did it. You know, it started, I started like, <laughs> and, and exactly I need to be home because I have commitments right. you know and and he saw it the night before was when he made this commitment to them that we would take them home you know and he makes these commitments without checking the weather without you know <laughs> knowing anything that might throw a kink in the timing of this stuff you know he just pops off and he says oh we can take you home on the way, you know, and it was going to be a seven hour drive for them and it, it made it an hour and a half flight for us to take them and then an hour flight from their home. So it, you know, but it's, you know, and, and, and it, God had that mm -hmm. though. He got me home by four. Everything was good. Bible study started at six. It was all good. We had some quality time with this couple inside the cockpit of the plane, not the cockpit, whatever, we were sitting in the plane. <laughs> Catherine's a pilot, so I have to like, not the cockpit. <laughs> yeah, we're not flying. Yeah, no, I don't want the cockpit. She does, I don't. <laughs> we were in the cabin, yeah. You know. Overnatural. Yes, and, and we have to learn to tweak that. We have to learn to let, because, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit did have something that was, you know, and I, 
I did. We got in the car and, and you know, the ice chest was broke open and Jimmy was like, there's some champagne in there and here's all these other drinks. And they looked at me and they're like, what are you drinking? And I said, this is a work day for me and I'm not drinking. So they had water also. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. Sometimes you can witness without actually cracking open the bottle. Right. And sliding it over to them. You know? Right. And, you know, I had made a comment to um, Deb, was the lady's name, that one of the other digni dignitaries that was at the Louisiana State Convention, the Arkansas couple, um, everything, she was on Facebook all the time on her phone. And, like, one time she leaned over to me and she's like, look, there's been a tick bite, and it's the most deadliest virus. I've got to call my kids and my children. And I said, no, pestilence can't come near our dwelling, you know. <laughs> and, and so this, and it was like every time I turned around, this lady was bringing up another tick bite or another something, something right. you know. And she was a relatively pleasant lady to be around, and it's not like she was dogging anybody. She wasn't, you know, just burying people in, you know, snippiness or whatever you want to call it but it was just that kind of negativity and so I had made a point I had said you know she's a little negative she's she's a precious lady but we've we've had to, you know we've had some conversations in the Lord you know and 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 Deb was like you know I, I thought about that after you said that and you're right and I said well we've been studying this for like a year and a half so I did I did get to you know, and we are more sensitive to that kind of stuff because we have been studying it in the Word. And so, yeah, it was a good weekend. I, I feel like, you know, it wasn't... Um, I worry about that sometimes being a place that I shouldn't be putting myself. But the first thing we did when we got there was we went into our room... And um, the state president of Louisiana had given us a gift, which is normal. You go into your room, and, and there's a gift there for you because um, we're honored guests and stuff. I opened it up, and it was a prayer, prayer blanket they had made. And the state president of Louisiana this year was a 90-year-old lady, great Christian lady, a little bundle of fire. I mean, oh, my gosh, she would make all of us tired. <laughs> and I'm just fixing to celebrate the 21st anniversary of my 29th birthday. <laughs> and she's 90, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so she would literally make all of us tired. Jimmy, one night they have a banquet and then they have a dance and that's normal. Jimmy asked her to dance and she looked up at him, he said, and she said, have you ever danced with a 90-year-old lady? <laughs> And he made some kind of a comment, you know, I don't know, but, but it was, yes, they did. They did dance. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the whole weekend was, there was a lot of God moments in there, but we have to pay attention to those. You know, there, there was a lot of other moments too. We have to pay attention to the God moments and take them as they come. I can just see it being such a blessing for you along with somebody else. Yeah. You know, the people that you was dealing with, but at the same time. They were a you, blessing yeah, to me. Look what, yeah, look, look, yes. look what you was getting. Because yeah. You got, had an opportunity to exercise all the stuff you've been studying. Yes. You got to put it into practice. Yes. At that moment. But if it, you came on home like you was trying to get home, <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. be able to put that no. into practice. No. No. And, you know, it also showed me that there's hope for the Oklahoma Elks Association, which that's where we're at now. Jimmy's president-elect of the Oklahoma Elks. There's hope that we can make, you know, because it was like every time I turned around, there was something about God coming up at the Louisiana State Convention from another person. It wasn't always just one person. Well, there's hope that, you know, we can get to where we're that obvious that, hey, you know, we may like to party and we may like to have a good time, which is not a sin in and of itself. We're Christians, too, and we're out here to do the Lord's work. And so, you know, I was. I was given that 
hopeful expectation back, where sometimes I get a little um, down and out about, okay, I feel like I'm living two separate lives, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I don't want to feel that way. And, and so that was, it was a very good experience. We weren't even supposed to be down there yet. The actual president couple had a grandbaby born this weekend. And so they opted to not go and let us go this year and they're gonna go next year. So, but it was a good experience and it was a good experience in the Lord and, and letting him do what he wants to do. But um, yeah, you know, it, we are, also in here, and it's later on, I think, and we're going to go ahead and cover the verses that I've got in here, but in our lives, a lot of the time, there, there are what one of the professors calls sandpaper people. I love that term. It's perfect, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, well, they rub us wrong every time they're around us. <laughs> Yeah, sandpaper people. They rub us wrong every time they're around us. And, um, you know, I think we wonder sometimes why they come into our lives. Why, are, why am I having to deal with this person? Hopefully, usually, there's not more than one or two at a time in our life. <laughs> but, but um, you know, when we respond in love and continue to respond in love, we eventually do make a difference. We eventually get to um to a pla to a better place and um anyway we just you know when when we respond the way that our natural mind would first take us it does hurt our testimony and so we have to remember always you know god has done so much for me and, and I can let this go. I can let this go. A lot of the times it's um, when you're waiting in line at Walmart or Homeland, you know, or we have appliances broken and we make those phone calls, or we've got something wrong with our credit card or our debit card and we have to make that phone call that we hate to make. You know, this is yeah. The that, uh, it's the part that the other person on the other end say something real crazy way out. Of yeah. Order to you. you, I mean, you know. Yeah. That's what this really just blows yeah. it all up. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I, I call it like, sometimes. Why you call here or something? Well, where else was I supposed to call? I call it sometimes dealing with stupid people. <laughs> you know, which. It probably is not something that I should call it. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that's a sandpaper again. <laughs> it's like, it's like, really? Did you just say that? <laughs> let me let me explain to you how to fix this problem that we're having. <laughs> and so, um, you know. Like a little. What were you saying, the little man? And I was came in. Oh. <clears throat> wouldn't get the gasoline at the place because it's a, come out of the city. Yeah. He, I thought it was, I thought the man was joking. I really did. At first, I just thought, oh, he just had the fun. He just joking. said, talking about, oh, my But man. you didn't tell him what happened. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, go ahead and tell what happened. You tell him. <laughs> you need the rest well, of the story. <laughs> <laughs> you got a story. I wasn't for sure. Because, like I said, I thought it was such a joke. I really didn't pay much attention until down to the end part of it. I think he was trying to get some gasoline, and his cart wouldn't work at the pump. Wasn't that what it was? It wouldn't work at the pump. It wouldn't work at the pump. So he'd come inside. And but he wanted them to go ahead and turn the pump on, but they wouldn't do it without having holding his driver's license. And he must have went left now. He went all the way left on that. I tried and, to calm him down. and like, wait, what? 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 I, like I said, I thought he was joking. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he just, he was, he was, all, and left and didn't get no gasoline. He, he left out of there, said all kinds of stuff. Hmm. So I thought, oh boy. Yeah, it's it's those kinds of moments sometimes that I'm talking about. Wait just a minute, hold on, wait just a minute. She was trying to soothe him. Yeah, she was trying to soothe him and get him calmed down. But like I said, I've been, and he didn't look angry or anything. Mm -hmm. I just thought the man was joking. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. That's that's what was just being said is just one wrong sentence from somebody and we go kind of off this way instead of staying here. Yeah, and the man, the, the guy that was in there, he, would, he, he said, this is the way they got to sit up. This is what I have to do. You know, mm -hmm. but you wasn't here in any of it. I got to show my back last night. I have to go somewhere else. Blah, 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 blah. But when we truly come to the understanding of what Jesus did, and we can stay in that humble spirit, you know, that he, tol he told us while he was walking on earth, it's in the red writing, you know, that we should stay humble. Yes. That, um, you know, blessed be, blessed be. And so when we keep ourselves before the Lord like little children, knowing that we can never pay the debts that we owed, but that through Jesus we have been forgiven anyway and adopted into the family of God, and that we are now seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You know, we have to sometimes keep in mind all of that, all of what took place on Calvary, but we also need to see ourselves on the throne right beside him because we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, right? Jesus translated us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God. So our own belief in that blessing comes from renewing our mind in who the Bible tells us that we are. And we should spend our time reminding ourselves and telling our friends, our loved ones, and even those who aren't quite nice to us about Christ and about who they are in Christ. Ephesians 4.32 says, And become useful and helpful and kind to one another. Tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted. Forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. You know, whether or not someone accepts your forgiveness is not your problem. We are called to forgive. The Holy Spirit, I believe, will sometimes bring to our recollection moments where we've maybe hurt someone else and maybe we're supposed to go to them and say, hey, I realize that what I said, you know, and, and I'm just, or what I did, and, and just ask for forgiveness. But once we do that in obedience, whether or not they accept our forgiveness is not up to us. It, it's not about that. But we have to be sure that when others are hurting us, that we do not let bitterness grow in our hearts. I wonder how many ways that we have offended God through the years, and yet Jesus, who took our offenses upon himself, keeps washing us white as snow so that we can stand before God in righteousness. Not our own righteousness, but his righteousness. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, 3 says, You, and I added this in here, that you is the Lord, will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both its inclination and its character, is stayed on you, because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. We're going to take a moment and go back to David and look at him because oftentimes when we blow up at other people or someone else blows up at us, we or they have already allowed their thoughts and emotions to put them in a woe is me position that then vomits all over every, everyone in the surrounding area. We're going to look at when um, it's 1 Samuel 30, verses 3 through 6. Let's read that first and then we'll talk about the story. It says, So David and his men came to town, and behold, it was burned, and their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. Then David and the men with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. David was greatly distressed. 
For the men spoke of stoning him because the souls of them all were bitterly grieved, each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So this all took place while David was in exile. They were in a town um, that was outside of another town that, that was their enemies, but he had kind of made friends with temporarily. And something happened while they were off and battling the battle that they needed to battle. And then they, and then they come home, and all their wives and children are gone from, from the camp, the town, whatever you want to call it, where they were staying. And David had accrued a following of around 400 men with families. And keep in mind, they were also in exile for some reason. Maybe they hadn't paid their taxes or whatever, but they were in exile from the king. So all this group of people, this whole group, was in exile. And David was the leader. He was the one that everybody saw as being responsible for taking care of them. He had to make sure that they were in a place where they could find plenty of food for all the families and the men that were there and where they were supposed to be relatively safe. But when the enemy came against all of them, they were pretty quick to blame David for their misfortune. You'd be amazed at some of the things that employees have come to us with through the years. We had a truck driver one time that received his truck and he was an owner operator, but the way that a lot of our owner operators work, um, their fuel and their parts and all of that's already out of their check before they get it because they operate on cards and stuff that are through the company. And so this guy comes in, he was a young man, had a family, and he comes in, it's summertime, and yeah, things had slowed down just a little bit, not a lot, but slowed down just a little bit. He comes in and he tells me, oh, I can't pay my bills on this. Well, I happened to know, because I wrote the check, that it was a relatively large check. And I happened to also know what I had written him checks for in the last, you know, couple of pay periods. And he starts in on why he can't pay his bills. Well, he has a new, and it's a tractor, but it's one of those toy tractors that, you know, all of us girls that have ever lived out in the country and had gardens and stuff would like to have. He can't pay his tractor bill which he bought on loan. He can't pay his car payment, which is brand new, and he, you know, bought on loan. And he can't pay this, and he can't pay that. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I'm allowing him to rant for a little while. And, and finally, I went and got his pay stubs from the last two or three checks, and I added them up, you know, which I didn't need to do. I just did that just to show him. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's not my fault you have all these new things that you bought on loan. And um, this is the amount of money you've been paid, which, you know, most people in Duncan, Oklahoma, would have been, like, in hog heaven over. And, <laughs> and it was like, I don't know what to tell you. It's not my fault that you have all these loans and you can't pay your bills. And But that's the mentality sometimes of people when they get themselves into a bind or whatever. Now, these people that were with David, they were all in exile with him. They knew. We're on the run. Anything could happen, right? It's not like we're living in America and we're supposed to be kept safe and we're supposed to be in our safe, warm little houses and, you know, no bombs are supposed to drop on us and, you know, all these things that we just take for granted because we're not in exile. These people, it was a huge group of people in exile, and all of a sudden, when things go really bad, David's the one that gets all the blame. So, the only way to stay, to walk in perfect and constant peace is to keep our minds committed to and focused on Christ. We see here in, in verse 6 that David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Can you just imagine how much bitter talk from people, 400 men, was coming at him? But rather than focus on that, David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. 
if you continued in the story, David went and got his 30 mighty men, his 30 inner, of his inner circle, and they went back and got their women and children with the help of the Lord. But, um, yeah, it was, it was tense for a little while. So if we keep focused on Christ and what he has done for us, bitterness will never find a place to take root in our hearts. Because to be truly focused on Christ is to be aware of the debt he paid and the gifts that he has bestowed upon us through Calvary. We are born of incorruptible seed. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Again, we can only control ourselves. We're not to blame other people or our circumstances because we cannot control them. We are responsible for our own self and our own emotions, our own actions and reactions, no matter what the circumstances are. We live in a fallen world, so there will always be trials and tribulations for us to walk through as long as we are this side of heaven, but God didn't do it, and we have to stay focused on him. James 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted from God. For God is incapable of being tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But every person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed, and baited by his own evil desire, lust, passions. Then the evil desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully matured, brings forth death. The evil desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. The dictionary definition of lust is a strong, overwhelming emotion. It does not necessarily always refer to things of a sexual or sensual nature, which is how we tend to define it most often. But looking back to Jesus' definition in the sower and the soul, we find that he says in Mark 4, 19, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Sin is an end result of a process that has already begun. Lust is an overwhelming emotion. It is the conception process. You cannot sin without your emotions or desires being involved. You can't hurt a person with your words unless you've already been thinking on it and nurturing it in your mind. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So this brings us full circle back to our faith, our belief. It's tied up in our words. Our words are founded in our thoughts, and our thoughts are founded in our hearts. Renewing our minds daily in the Word of God and in prayer will fix the root, the heart, so that the seed, the words, the harvest will come. The Holy Spirit doesn't deal with us over our actions, but He deals with us over the attitude of our hearts. And we've already talked about the sandpaper people and how we have to remain, you know, in that attitude that God teaches us in the Bible, that we learn from the Word. We're blessed to be a blessing. And in order to be a blessing, we have to remember how blessed we are at all times when we're out and about in our daily life. So the fourth most important thing in prayer is to depend on the Holy Spirit to help you in your prayer life. Spend time praying in the Spirit in order to build ourselves up as David did. Praying in the Spirit shuts our own thoughts down and allows the Lord to speak to us, to love us. As we've discussed in previous lessons, one important way the Holy Spirit helps us in prayer is to give us utterance in other tongues. Paul discusses praying in tongues in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. I've got 14 here. And sometimes 
those sandpaper people in our lives need us to spend some time praying in tongues. In order for our spirit to come into an understanding with the Spirit of God and how in particular that maybe we can minister to a particular person that we're having trouble figuring out how come they keep lingering in our, in our circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that we want to like shove, <laughs> you know, get out. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15 says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays, but my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps nobody. Then what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit by the Holy Spirit that is within me, but I will also pray intelligently with my mind and my understanding. I will sing with my spirit by the Holy Spirit that is within me, but I will also sing intelligently with my mind and my understanding. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God on behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. So when we allow our mind to be shut down and we pray in tongues in the spirit, we are allowing our spirit to talk with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God to give us direction. But the question is, you know, then we're praying in tongues. Obviously, we don't understand it. So how do we take that from there? The scriptures say, though, that speaking in tongues is a way of magnifying and worshiping God, and it's a way for the Holy Spirit's help in intercession and supplication. And so as we go through these, and, and again, I said we're going to dive in deeper in the Holy Spirit in the fall, and we're going through this a little fast this afternoon or this morning um, as we spend time praying in tongues and groaning in the spirit the word of God the scriptures they become revelation knowledge to us God wants us to understand the mysteries that he has for us he wants us to be able to live in the love that he has that he has set for us and the path that he has set for us he wants us to be able to minister to the people that are brought into our lives and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive wisdom for our lives and sometimes words of knowledge for other people. As we pray in the Spirit, He helps us in our weakness. Speaking in tongues is also a way of magnifying and worshiping God. Acts 10, 44 through 46 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all who were listening to the message. And the believers from among the circumcised, the Jews, who came with Peter were surprised and amazed because the free gift of the Holy Spirit had been bestowed and poured out largely even on the Gentiles. For they heard them talking in unknown tongues, languages, and extolling and magnifying God. And so number five on the most important parts of prayer is the Holy Spirit's help in intercession and supplication, which we've already been talking about. The Holy Spirit is to help us pray. He's to help us pray intercession. At times, we feel led to pray for someone, but don't really know what to pray for them because we don't know what their needs are. We have a lot of people come into our lives that are just there like fleetingly, but yet um, we know that there was a purpose for it. We know there was a reason for it. But as we submit to the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues, He will give us utterance to pray 
the perfect will of God for them. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding on behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we find that other than praying in tongues, which will build us up in the Spirit, all other gifts of the Holy Spirit are for blessing other people. We are blessed to be a blessing. Again, blessing comes through faith and praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, forgiving others and praying in the Spirit. Blessing comes by ministering to other people. Whether the ministry is to believe salvation from Jesus or to believe Jesus for being able to live a kingdom of heaven life, to live in health, to live in prosperity, to live the blessed life, we are blessed when we start blessing others. Blessing others starts with not holding their faults against them. Part of the Elks Pledge for new members is to learn the motto, which is, the faults of our members we shall write upon the sand. Jesus knelt and wrote in the sand, right? And he challenged those who were brought to stone the lady who was caught in adulteress. Just the lady, not the man. That's just, that's just a squirrel. Just the lady was brought before them, naked, drawn out, caught in adultery, but just the lady was brought before them to be stoned. And Jesus said, you know, whoever has no sin, cast the first stone. And everybody disappeared. You know, it's funny too, how he did, well, it's not funny, but amazing, that he knew the man that was involved in that situation. Mm -hmm. But he didn't embarrass him, nor the lady, about, you know, group. right. He just addressed the issue because they had brought her out so mm -hmm. everybody could see her. So he, he talked, to, talked to the man without addressing his name, by not calling the name because he's whoever is without sin. So the man knew he, yeah. was, he wasn't without whoever sin. Whoever is without sin, yeah. Without sin. So that, he knew it was him. So it, it got, he addressed him mm -hmm. and nobody else didn't even know, know about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, a lot of times that's how we need to have things, you know, mm -hmm. with someone else, you know, mm -hmm. not where it's a big public thing where we, you know, say something right. to them in front of everybody and right. make a big deal out of it. But right. But still we address what's going on. Not holding faults against someone springboards us into a place where we can intercede for them in prayer and minister to them in the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 5 through 11 says, and there are distinctive varieties of service and ministration, but it is the same Lord who is served. And there are distinctive varieties of operation, of working to accomplish things, but it is the same God who inspires and energizes them all in all. But to each one is given the manifesta manifestation of the Holy Spirit the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and for profit. To one is given in and through the Holy Spirit the power to speak a message of wisdom and to another the power to express a word of knowledge and understanding according to the same Holy Spirit. To another wonder-working faith by the same Holy Spirit. To another the extraordinary powers of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophetic insight the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose. To another, the ability to discern and distinguish between the utterances of true spirits and false ones. To another, various kinds of unknown tongues. To another, the ability to interpret such tongues. All these gifts, achievements, and abilities are inspired and brought to pass by one and the same Holy Spirit, who apportions to each person individually exactly as he chooses. So again, blessing for yourself and for others comes through faith and praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. 
forgiving others and praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit helps us to intercede for others and it builds us up in our faith. 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 are all about praying in and operating in the Holy Spirit. And I highly recommend sitting down and studying and praying for revelation over these chapters. The spiritual understanding, revelation knowledge, not just head knowledge of these chapters is where our power, our authority in Jesus comes into play to be active in our Christian walk. I believe that you know, the working of the Holy Spirit in our life on a daily basis when we submit to Him, that that, that is so key to being able to walk through and not give in to snipping at somebody. It, it's, it's the key to being able to sit back and say, okay, this is not how I planned for the day to go, but, you know, what do you have for me? And, and, and if I'm supposed to be where I thought I was supposed to be, it'll happen. You know, it'll, it'll do it. Um, and when we walk in the natural, when we walk the way that, you know, TV, the news, the Facebook, the, the everything else that's coming at us, then, you know, we get off into, well, you shouldn't be treating me like that. You know, I deserve better. Um, do we? We deserve to be hanging on a cross. Do we deserve better? Um, God has better for us. But he tells us that we're blessed to be a blessing. So number seven is the interpretation of tongues in private prayer. The seventh most important thing in prayer is to interpret your tongues as the Holy Spirit wills in your private prayer life. 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 16 says, Therefore the person who speaks in an unknown tongue should pray for the power to interpret and explain what he says. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, prays, but my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps nobody. Then what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, by the Holy Spirit that is within me, but I will also pray intelligently with my mind and understanding. I will sing with my spirit, by the Holy Spirit that is within me, but I will sing intelligently with my mind and understanding also. Otherwise, if you bless and render thanks with your spirit, thoroughly aroused by the Holy Spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider or he who is not gifted with interpreting of unknown tongues say the amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you are saying? It is true that it's not always necessary for us to know what we are praying about in tongues, but when it is necessary, we can pray for the understanding and the Holy Spirit will tell us. Blessing for yourself and for others comes through faith and praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, forgiving others, and praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit helps us to intercede for others and it builds us up in our faith. Revelation from the Spirit in our prayers is to be fruitful. It's to bless others because we're blessed to be a blessing. He gives us food for our own hearts and more so that we can overflow with blessing to others. If we take our food, our revelation knowledge, and hide it away, it will rot. Just like the manna in the wilderness, we are blessed to be a blessing. We are to share what God gives us, whether it's a gift of knowledge, a gift of wisdom, whatever that is, we are to share what God gives us. We're blessed to be a blessing and we share that by loving others and forgiving them. One of the issues in my life that I've struggled with the most is the resource of time. When you were talking about, you know, about a minute ago, I have learned 
that if I get up every morning and I spend my time with God and I give Him my day, there's always time. Mm -hmm. Used to, I felt like I was just going in circles and there wasn't enough time to accomplish all the things. And a lot of times I didn't notice the important things because I was so focused on trying to get my, my list accomplished mm -hmm. for that day. And that's, it's only been in about the last two years that I'm kind of starting. And when I start feeling that time crunch thing, and I, ha I just have to let it go. Yeah. You know, that's been a real struggle, a real issue. You know, time is a resource just like money. Yes, it is. And we're to give a certain amount of our time just to the Lord. I mean, I had a preacher that we sat under that used to say, you know, you have to tithe your time just like money. You have to, you are to give 10% plus to the Lord. And yes, and, and that's been a learning curve for me in this last year and a half that I've been teaching Bible studies is the day does go better when you start it out with God. I mean, and there's been times when he wakes me up in the night, you know, and I've gotten up way before I would normally get up. And amazingly, I had the energy to go out and finish my day, even without a nap, which is a big deal to me and always has been. You ever, so. Every time I uh, wake up at 4 or 5 or something and go to the bathroom, what you said comes to my mind every time I get up and go to the bathroom. At four or five o'clock morning, I think back. I thought I think back to the time I the Lord took us up to to tell us something, but we run to the bathroom and run to get back to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this morning at four something, I think the same thought come to my mind. I thought when I got back to bed, I thought, Well, Lord, now if there's something you want to tell me, go ahead on and tell me. But I laid on that down and went back to sleep and slept to seven something. But how many conversations does he have with you while you're laying in bed? I mean, I literally have a lot of conversations with God while I'm laying in bed. And Especially if I get back in there and I don't go to sleep, I'm just almost mm -hmm. immediately after I get back in there and I just like start waking up, then I think, well, you know, what, what is it? Is mm -hmm. it you know, I want to listen and think and concentrate and in that quiet place when nothing else is really happening, whether it's in the afternoon nap or whether it's in the wee hours of the morning, when we're not really asleep, to me, I mean, it's like, okay, Lord, you know, what are you saying? What do you have for me? What scripture would you like for me to meditate on? What, what are you teaching me? You know, what's going on? And um, it's, it's been a real difference maker for me. I wish that I was getting credit for it already from those people closest to me that, you know, I've already developed this bad reputation of like holding grudges and and <laughs> and I'm like Yeah. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> But he still brings it up to other people, and I'm like, and you can't say anything, you know. It's it's going to take some time to like get past that, and so it's it's like okay. When's the last time I do that? Think about now. Oh yeah. You haven't done that in a while. That was a long time ago. Are you seeking credit? Well. Yes. <laughs> Hush, Catherine. <laughs> yes. Yes. I want credit for that improvement. 